Hi there and thank you for joining me. In this video we are going to take a look through the AQA Foundation GCSE Maths Paper 3 Calculator Paper from June 2019 simply by looking at each question in turn and looking at some methods and answers. So let's make a start with question 1. It asks us to circle the value of the digit 2 in the answer to 5200 divided by 10. Well, first of all, we have to do the sum 5200 divided by 10. And the easiest way to do that is we take the decimal point and we move it one place to the left. So our answer is 520. Say that out loud, 520. The 2 is in the tens column, therefore its value is 20. Question 2. Solve x minus 8 equals 5 and circle the answer. I usually do this by rearranging. If I've got y minus 8 equals 5, I take the minus 8 and I move it to the other side of the equation. I therefore get x equals 5 and because we've moved it across to the other side it becomes a plus 8. x equals 5 plus 8 and 5 plus 8 is 13. So x equals 13. In question 3 we are asked to circle the fraction that is equal to 2 and a quarter, a mixed number. These are all fractions with quarters on the bottom, they're all improper fractions. So we're being asked how many quarters are there in 2 and a quarter. Well, we have one quarter here, we need to know how many quarters there are in the two whole ones and the easiest way to do that is to multiply the 2 and the 4. 2 times 4 equals 8. Then we have to add this one quarter here that we already have. So 8 plus 1 is 9. So our answer is we have 9 quarters. Question 4. Circle the expression which means x divided by y. Well, quite simply, if something is going to be divided by something, we put it under the line. So 3 divided by 4 becomes 3 over 4. So x divided by y is x over y. If you want to be sure, have a look at some of the others. Well, this is y divided by x. It's the wrong way around. This is 1 divided by x times y. So there's a multiplication in that one. And this is 1 divided by x plus y. So they all have functions in there that we're not being asked about. Question 5 has given us three fractions and a decimal. And we've been asked to put them in order from the smallest to the largest. I think the simplest way is to turn all these four into decimals so that we can make an easier comparison. So let's do that. To turn a fraction into a decimal, we would have 31 divided by 40. It's the top divided by the bottom. And if we do that, we get 0.775. 3 divided by 4, that's 3 quarters. We already know that is not 0.75 for 3 quarters. 7 divided by 10 is not 0.7. And the final one we already have as a decimal, not 0.725. We need to put these in order now. They are all zeros, point sevens. So the first column is the same, the second column is the same. Let's have a look at the third column. Sometimes if you get a little bit confused by these, it's a good idea to put the zeros in so that they all have the same number of decimal places. It makes it a little bit easier to view and to figure out which are the smallest. If we look at these numbers now, we have 775, 750, 700 and 725. So 7 Double O is the smallest, so that is the one that was 0 0.7. The second one is 725, so 0 0.725 will go second. The third will be 0 0.75, which is that one there. We don't have to put the zeros in in the answers. And the fourth one, 0 0.775. I think putting them in a column like this so you can make a direct comparison of the numbers is the easiest way to solve a question like this. Of course, what we have now is all the numbers as decimals and we need to put them back so that we are giving the answer by using the original numbers. 0.7 was 7 tenths. 
0.725 was the decimal that we had already so we can simply copy that one down 0.75 we said was three quarters and 0.775 is 31 over 40 so we've now given the examiner the original numbers in order from smallest to largest let's move on to question six and part a all about downloading albums so Josh downloads album a which has 11 tracks price of each track is the same and the total cost is eight pounds eighty he also downloads album B which has 14 tracks we have to work out the cost of downloading album B and we make the assumption that each track costs the same as a track on A. Well, the first thing we need to do is find out what is the price of one track. So let's move back to album A. We are told the total price is £8.80 and it has 11 tracks. So if we divide that by 11, the answer we get is 0.8. In other words, 0.8 or 0.80 is 80p per track. We're now going to use this information to work out the cost of downloading B. It's 80 pence a track. Let's carry on writing this as pounds, not 0 0.80. And this time we know there are 14 tracks. We're assuming the price is the same per track. So 80 pence times 14 equals 11 pounds 20. So that is the total cost of downloading album B. Three, two, one. Now in part B, we are actually told that the tracks on B, the album B, are not the same compared to the cost of each track on A. So it gets a little more complicated. It says the cost of six of the tracks on B actually cost five pence more and the cost of eight tracks are five pence less. What does this tell you about your answer to part A? Well, let's have a look at this. If six of the tracks are five pence more, six times five, that means the price will go up 30p. But if eight of the tracks are five pence less each, five times eight means the price will go down 40p. So if we are adding 30p on, but we are taking 40 pence off, that means that this album is actually going to cost 10 pence less. So what does this tell you about your answer to part A? The total cost is less. It's going to be 10 pence less. In question seven, we have a pictogram and it tells us about houses in a street. Each house has three, four or five bedrooms. So we have a line for the three bedroom, the four bedroom and the five bedroom. And we're told how many bedrooms are there in total on this street. So let's have a look. We've got houses as the symbol for this pictogram. And importantly, the key that one symbol actually represents two houses. So in other words, two and two and two and two. On the end here, we only have half a symbol so that must represent only one house. So three bedroom houses, there are two, four, six, eight, nine altogether. Four bedroom houses, two, four, six, eight, ten. And five bedroom houses, two, and again, one house there, that is three. So this tells us the number of houses of each type. We need to know how many bedrooms. Well, these nine houses have three bedrooms that is 27 bedrooms altogether these 10 houses are all four bedroom houses so that's 10 times 4 so in total 40 bedrooms and these three houses have five bedrooms each so that's 3 times 5 is 15 so to get the total number we simply need to add these up 3 7 8 and altogether we have 82 bedrooms for question eight we are told that four positive whole numbers add up to 84 one of the numbers is a multiple of 17 the other three numbers are equal 
and we're asked what are the four numbers. So we need to find a multiple of 17 and then three other equal numbers that add up to 84. Let's first of all then work out these multiples of 17. In other words, numbers on the 17 times table. One possible multiple of 17 will be 1 times 17, so it could be just 17. 2 times 17, 34. 3 times 17 is 51. 4 times 17 is 68. Now 5 times 17 is 85. That would not fit up to a total of 84. So the multiple of 17 has to be one of these numbers. Now, we need to know whether or not we can find three equal numbers that would add to one of these to make 84. So the simple way to do that, I think, is to take 84 and subtract each of these numbers to see whether we can find a whole number. So 84 minus 17 equals 67. Now, if we take 67 and divide it by 3, we are not going to get three whole numbers. It doesn't divide exactly. Similarly, if we look at 84 minus 34, we get the number 50. Again, 50 divided by 3 does not come up with a whole number, so that can't be our answer. Let's look at the third possibility. 84 minus 51 equals 33. Now, if we take 33 and divide that by 3, we get 11. So there is definitely one possible answer. For the first number, the multiple of 17 to be 51, and then the other three numbers, 11, 11, and 11. Let's just make sure that's the only possibility by looking at the last option, which is 84 minus 68. Now, that gives us 16. Can we divide that by 3? No, we can't. That doesn't work. So our answer has indeed got to be 15, 11, 11, and 11. Question 9 is all about wallpaper. Jim wants to buy 10 rolls of wallpaper. And we can either buy them in single rolls, packs of 3, or packs of 5. And we want to work out the cheapest price for 10 rolls. Let's have a look at this then. If he buys them in single rolls, that's going to be £12.50 and he wants to buy 10 of them, so that's going to be £125. If he buys packs of three, well, he's wanting 10, so he would have to buy three packs of three rolls, so that would be £34.50 multiplied by three, which equals £103.50. But don't forget that's only nine rolls. He would then have to buy a single roll as well to make up the 10, so that will be plus £12.50, so his overall price would be £116. Or you can look at the packs of five, that's £58.75. He only needs to buy two of those packs, therefore his total price is £117.50. There are three prices. We've got £125, £117.50, and the cheapest option is to buy three packs of three rolls and a single roll, £116. Question 10 takes us into the world of angles. We have, first of all, a rectangle, ABCD. We have a triangle, ABE, which we know is equilateral. And we have another triangle, CDE, the lower one here, which is isosceles. We are asked to work out the angle here at X. We are clearly going to have to find some of the other angles in order to do that. So let's apply some of the rules that we know in order to find X. First of all, if we have an equilateral triangle, that means the sides are equal, but so are the angles. And because angles in a triangle add up to 180, then in equilateral triangle, it means each angle is 60. So we can tell what this part of this center point here is. And I think we need to build up these parts in order to work out X. Let's have a look at what else we can do to this center point here. Well, the bottom triangle is isosceles. We know the two sides are equal because we've got the two lines going through the two sides here. It also means 
that these two angles here are equal. We know what this angle here is at the corner D because the overall shape is a rectangle. Therefore, here we have a right angle. We know a right angle is 90 degrees. because we have 180 degrees in a triangle. The other two angles are 25 each. They add up to 50. We take that away. We are left with 130 degrees. So this angle here is 130. Now, looking at the diagram, if we have an equilateral triangle and we have an isosceles triangle inside a rectangle, then we effectively have a line of symmetry straight down the center of the diagram, which means that angle X and the angle at the point E here are going to be the same. In other words, this angle here is the same as this. They are both X. So let's look at the numbers. We have 130 degrees at the bottom here and we have 60 degrees for the top angle. So if we add those two together, that gives us 190 degrees. Now we know that angles in a full circle add up to 360. If we take 190 away from that, we are going to end up with 170 degrees. So looking again, this one is 60, this one is 30. That is 190 in total. We take away from the full circle, it means these two angles at the sides here, the two x's, must add up to 170. We know they are the same angle, so 170 divided by 2 gives us 85 degrees. And that's our answer. x equals 85 degrees. Question 11, A and B gives us number machines and in part A we're asked to complete the number machine. Let's have a look, we've got A. We're then told that there is a function that we need to find, which we then multiply by five and end up with an output of five A plus 10. I think the way forward here is not to go forward at all, but backwards and strip this back down in reverse to find out what this function is. So if we are starting with 5a plus 10, don't forget if we go backwards, we have to reverse the function. So we end up with 5a plus 10, we are going to divide by five. That means we divide each term by five. So 5a divided by five is just a, and 10 divided by five is two. So we now know that after we have taken the a and performed the missing function, we end up with a plus 2. So the missing function must be the plus 2. Let's check this out and make sure it works. a plus 2 equals a plus 2. Multiplied by 5 is 5a plus 10. So we have the correct function. It's plus 2. Moving on to part b, write down the output y in terms of x. Okay, we have x. What are we doing first? We are dividing it by 2. That means x divided by 2, we would write as x over 2. We are then adding 4, so in the end we would have x over 2 plus 4. And that would be your final answer. Question 12 tells us the first four triangular numbers are 1, 3, 6 and 10 and it asks us what the next number is. Well, let's just draw it to make sure. The first triangular number is 1. I'm going to put one circle there. The second triangular number is created by putting another two dots there. So we have a triangle. That is our 3. The next triangular number we have to add 
three. Maybe you can imagine balls on a pool table. So now there are six. The next triangular number, we end up adding four. That gives us 10. So the next one, in fact, we have to add another five to give us the triangle. So 10 plus five is 15. Write down all the prime numbers between 40 and 50. So a prime number will not divide exactly by any other number than itself and one. First of all, we know it can't be an even number. So all the even numbers we can disregard, they're all divisible by two. So it's the odd numbers. So 41, useful here if you know your times tables. Does 41 divide by any other whole number? No, it doesn't. Let's have a look at 43. Again, no, you can't divide 43 by a whole number. 45 divides by five or nine. So that does have other whole factors. It's not a prime number. 47 is another one that will not divide by any other whole number. 49 divides by seven. Seven sevens are 49. Therefore, it's not a prime number. So your answer is these three numbers. In question 14, we are converting between units and we are also including the metric and imperial units. Thankfully, we have the conversions here. One cubic foot is 6.23 gallons. One cubic foot is also 0 0.028 cubic meters. We are being asked to convert from gallons into cubic meters. Now, we don't have a direct conversion between the two so we're going to have to convert it firstly into cubic feet and then into cubic meters so let's have a look at this we are told we have 3115 gallons now we know that one cubic foot is 6.23 gallons so to convert from gallons into cubic feet we're going to have to divide so our first calculation is going to be 3115 divided by the conversion rate, which is 6.23. That gives us an answer of exactly 500. So we now have 500 cubic feet. We now need to convert that into cubic meters. So we are going from cubic feet into cubic meters. Now this time it's going to be a multiply. We have 500 cubic feet. We know that one is 0.028 cubic meters. So we're going to have to multiply by 0.028 to get our answer, which comes out at 14 cubic meters written as meters to the power three at the bottom here. So 14 cubic meters is our answer. Question 15, circle the correct statement. One third is smaller or equal to 30%. One third equals 30%. One third is smaller than 30% or one third is not equal to 30%. This looks a little complicated to start with, but actually, if you think about it, one third, that's one divided by three, is actually equal to 33.3% recurring percent. It's larger than 30%. Therefore, it cannot be equal to it. It cannot be smaller than it. And it cannot be smaller or equal to it. The fact is, one third is not equal to 30%. Therefore, not equal is your only option. Question 16, bit of a visual one this. It's asking which shape must have rotational symmetry. And we need to circle the answer. Well, if we look at rotational symmetry, it means that the shape when rotated has to look exactly the same in at least one other position. Now, I can do this a little bit easier than you could on an exam paper. But if I have an isosceles triangle and I rotate it, it does not look exactly the same in any other position. It can go all the way around to the start before it appears exactly the same. and. The same is true of a trapezium. If we rotate a trapezium, it does not look the same in any other position. 
a good tester to turn it upside down. No, it looks different all the way around until we get back to the start. A kite is something I can't draw quite so easily on here, but again, if we have a shape like a kite, if you visualize turning this round, it will not look the same any other position. Let's have a look at the parallelogram. Well, this is a parallelogram. Now, if I turn this round and I go particularly at 180 degrees to there, it looks exactly the same. So one way up or the other way up, both look the same. Therefore, it does have rotational symmetry and indeed must have to be a parallelogram. So circle your answer. Question 17, part A, tells us that a shop sells ice creams and each ice cream has two scoops. Possible flavours, vanilla, strawberry, chocolate and mint. It tells us that two scoops can be the same flavour or different. Let's have a look at all the possible options for the two scoops. First of all, let's assume one of the flavours is vanilla. We can therefore have vanilla with vanilla if the two scoops are the same. We can, however, also have vanilla with strawberry, vanilla with chocolate, and vanilla with mint. Let's have a look at the strawberry one. If we have strawberry as our first flavour, then the second one can also be strawberry. We can have strawberry with vanilla, but we've already got that listed here. So the other options are strawberry with chocolate and strawberry with mint. Let's put chocolate in as our first flavour. We could have chocolate with chocolate. We've already got chocolate with strawberry and chocolate with vanilla. So our other option is chocolate and mint. Finally, let's put mint in as one of our flavours. We can have mint with mint. We've already got chocolate and mint, strawberry and mint, vanilla and mint. Therefore, we have all our options. In 17b, we are sticking with the ice cream shop, but we are now being asked to complete a pie chart. We are told in an hour, the shop sells 180 scoops of ice cream, and we are told how many of each flavor. We are asked to complete the pie chart to represent this. The first thing to realize, of course, is that a pie chart goes around a full circle. It's 360 degrees. Now, we're told the shop sells 180 scoops. Therefore, we need to know how many degrees we need to represent for each scoop. This is nice and convenient because 360 divided by 180 gives us exactly two. So it means for each scoop, we need to represent it by two degrees. So we can quite simply change scoops into degrees by multiplying each of these by two. So 90 degrees, 150 degrees, 100 degrees, and 20 degrees. And just to check, 90 plus 150 is 240, plus 100, 340, plus 20 is 360. So that gives us the size of the angles for each of these different flavors. You're gonna have to use a protractor. This is not necessarily quite so easy on my screen here, but let's have a go. The one thing I can do is cheat ever so slightly. You're gonna need your protractor to measure 90 degrees. I can in fact draw that in like this. So this would be 90 degrees, and I know this is my vanilla section. You're then gonna have to take your protractor and measure the degrees. So we need to put the protractor right in the center there, and again, this is where it becomes a little difficult for me. Move the protractor round so that we have the zero on the first of the red lines there. Let's just see if I can get it in place. There we go. I will just shrink my protractor slightly. Again, you've got paper and pen, a little bit different situation. I need strawberry 150 degrees. So 150 is just here. Now, it's sometimes difficult to make a mark on the edge of the protractor, but it's going to be there. So 150 degrees. The next job is to draw a line then, which represents 150 degrees, which is going to be 
just here and then you take your protractor pull it back on to the center again move it round so we have the zero on my last red line which is about there we need a hundred degrees for the chocolate so a hundred degrees is here this is going to be my last line because if I now draw a line from the center up to my hundred degrees here which is about there again try to be as accurate as you can I have a little difficulty with this this becomes the 150 degrees which is your strawberry this becomes 100 degrees which is your chocolate and the last little section here has to therefore be the mint at 20 degrees question 18 we have a grid with a triangle and we're asked to draw an enlargement of the triangle with a scale factor half don't be fooled by the word word don't be fooled by the word enlargement that makes it sound as though it's getting bigger but of course scale factor of a half means it actually has to be half the size it's been divided by two let's have a look then so somewhere on the grid doesn't matter where the original triangle has a base of four squares therefore half of that my base is going to be two squares the height of the original triangle is one two three four five six squares therefore mine is going to be one two three it's going to come to here so I simply need to complete a triangle like that you can do it any way up you can put it anywhere on the grid but as long as it has a base of two and a height of three half the size of the original then that's the correct answer question 19a is our first step into a little bit of algebra on this paper and it says simplify fully and we have a string of terms here so what we're being asked to do is collect like terms don't forget terms with different powers are not like terms so we have to be careful with that let's start then with the a squared we have 3a squared we have minus a squared so 3 minus 1 gives us 2a squared that's the a squares out of the way let's have a look at the a's we have plus 7a plus 8a so plus 7 plus 8 is plus 15a that gets rid of the a's we are just left with the numbers we have plus 3 minus 4 3 minus 4 is minus 1 so 2a squared plus 15a minus 1 is our answer and part B is asking us to factorize this expression so we know we need to use brackets on this one if we're going to factorize we take out the highest common factor for each part of the terms let's look at the numbers we have 24 and 20 the highest common factor of 24 and 20 is 4 we then have a y squared and a y again the highest common factor is the y we then need to complete the inside of the brackets to put in terms that would bring us back to where we started in other words if we have 4 and we want to go to 24 we have to multiply by 6 if we have a y and we want to go to y squared we have to multiply by y we then have a minus because if we go from 4 to minus 20 we would have to multiply by minus five and the y we already have in there so that's our answer my spacing's not too good but it's four y six y minus five question 20 solve x squared equals 196 so obviously we need to find the value of x to do this we would find the square root of both sides the square root of x squared is x and the square root of 196 is 14 so there is your answer x is 14 in question 21 we're told that John has nine pounds to the nearest pound and that Ellie to the nearest 50 pence has six pounds 50 now this nearest means that the amounts that they have have actually been rounded we need to know what the maximum actual amount that each of them could have so we can find their total amount of money let's have a look at John we are told that he has nine pounds now to the nearest pound 
we want to go up we want to find his maximum now the next pound from nine pound if we were rounding would be ten pounds let's have a look at what he could have and the best way is to look at the halfway position here if he had nine pounds fifty the rules of rounding say that to the nearest pound that would go to ten pounds however if he has nine pounds forty nine the rules of rounding say that to the nearest pound that would be nine pounds so nine pounds forty nine is the maximum amount that he could possibly have let's have a look at ellie ellie has six pounds fifty now we want to know the maximum she could have now the next 50 pence up for her would be seven pounds if we were rounding again let's look at the halfway point if she had six pounds 75 that would round to six pounds 80 which actually is closer to seven pounds if she has six pounds 74 that actually rounds to six pounds 70 which is nearer to six pound 50 so the maximum she can have is six pounds 74 Let's write the two totals out of here. £9.49 will be his maximum. £6.74 will be hers. Add them together. The total that they could possibly have would be £16.23. Question 22. We've got a formula. T equals N squared minus 12 over N. And we've to first of all for part A work out T when N equals 5. So let's put that in t equals n squared that will be 5 squared well 5 squared is 5 times 5 is 25 minus 12 divided by 5 let's carry on with that then that is t equals 25 minus and 12 divided by 5 is 2.4 so t equals 25 minus 2.4 is 22.6 question 22 B I'm including the whole question in here so we can still see the formula because B asks why is T always positive when n is negative so let's consider this n is a negative number well first of all if n is negative then that must mean that n squared is positive because it would be a negative number squared negative times negative is a positive so n squared is going to be positive also if n were negative so i might write that again if n was negative then look at the second part of the equation 12 divided by n that would be 12 divided by a negative number it would be positive divided by negative would be negative now let's see how this works that means so we therefore have a positive number minus a negative number we have a positive here take away a negative now if you are taking away a negative that has to be a positive number question 23 in an hour a machine can make 600 nuts or 720 bolts the machine starts working at three o'clock it makes 900 nuts and then changes to making bolts how many bolts will the machine make by 8 p.m. okay so 3 p.m. it starts making nuts and it makes 900 we know that 600 nuts is one hour so one hour equals 600 nuts therefore to make 900 that must be 1.5 hours 900 divided by 600 is one and a half so 1.5 hours so it makes bolts until 4 30 p.m then it starts making 
volts. So 4.30 up to 8 o'clock, 4.30 to 5 o'clock is half an hour, it has 3.5 hours to make volts. It makes 720 in one hour, so 720 times 3.5 equals 2,520 volts. 3, 2, 1. Question 24. Two solids J and K have the same density. We're asked to complete the table and include units in our answers. Well, for this we have mass, volume and density. We need to use one of the formula triangles that tells us how to work this out, which is mass, density and volume. Let's look at the first solid, J. We don't know the density. But looking at the triangle, we know that density is mass over volume, which equals 48 divided by 8. Therefore, the density is 6. And when we're looking at the units, then we are talking grams per centimetre cubed. We're now told that both the solids have the same density, so we can complete the density for K. It is also 6 grams per centimetre cubed. What we don't know is the volume. But again, looking at the triangle, we can say that volume is mass divided by density. Therefore, it is 78 divided by 6, which equals 13. So our answer is 13 centimetres cubed. Question 25 takes a little bit of reading, so let's have a look. It says towns P, Q and R, you see them on the map here, are connected by roads P, Q, P, R and Q, R. We're then given information. P, R is 10 kilometres longer than P, Q and Q, R is twice as long as P, R. The total length of the three roads is 170 kilometres and we have to work out what PQ is. So we've been given comparisons here and they all start with PQ. So I am going to say that PQ is equal to X. Let's just simplify this down. Let PQ equal X. So the length of PQ is x. So if PQ is x, we are then told that PR is 10 kilometers longer. That must mean that PR is x plus 10 kilometers. We now know what PR is in terms of x. We finally want to know what QR is. Well, we are told that QR is twice as long as PR. So if PR is X plus 10, then QR is two times X plus 10. So in terms of X, we now have an expression for each of the three roads. And we know that all these added together equal 170 kilometers. So in other words, X plus x plus 10 plus now let's expand these brackets 2x plus 10 that would be 2x plus 20 equals 170 let's collect like terms we have 1 2 3 4 x's here plus the 10 and the 20, we have 30. So 4x plus 30 equals 170. I'm going to move my calculations up here. Let's rewrite that. 4x plus 30 equals 170. Let's move this around. That means that 4x equals, moving the 30 across, it becomes minus 30. So 4x equals 140. Therefore, x equals 140 divided by 4, x equals 35 
kilometers and that's our answer because don't forget x is pq and it's pq that we're being asked for question 26 mia wants to borrow six thousand pounds and repay it with interest after two years she sees two offers for loans and here we have offer one compound interest three percent a year offer two compound interest one percent in the first year and five percent in the second year mia says i will pay back the same amount because the average of one and five is three is she correct well the way to prove this is to work out exactly how much interest she is going to pay let's have a look at offer one we are putting in six thousand pounds and it's going to be for two years we have to look at each year separately first of all we need to add three percent on there a number of different ways you can do this i'm going to do it using decimals therefore it's going to be multiplied by 1.03 that will give us six thousand one hundred and eighty pounds now that's after year one because it's compound interest we then start year two with exactly that amount six thousand one hundred and eighty pounds and again we need to work out what that is with three percent on 1.03 and that gives us a total of six three six five point four oh that will be the amount that you would pay back in total let's look at offer two we're starting with the same six thousand but this time in the first year we're only paying one percent so that would be multiplied by 1.01 .01, which means that at the end of the first year we are paying back the 60 pounds but in fact the second year we then have 6060 in there which is going to grow by 5% 1.05 and the total on that is 6363 so again these two amounts are the total amounts payable after the two years you can give these two as your amount or you can simply say that the interest payable would be the 365 pounds 40 on this offer one and an offer two it would be 363 pounds exactly so they are not the same you are paying slightly more interest on offer one question 27 here are two sets of numbers a and b we are told the mean of set a to the mean of set b as a ratio is three to eight we have to work out x the missing number in set b here so let's have a look we need the mean of set a to start with so if we add all these numbers together we would get 564 and if we divide that by four to get the mean we get 141 now let's have a look at this ratio we have ratio a to b and we know it's three to eight now in that ratio we can put the mean of a as 141 we then have to work out the equivalent here the way you would do that is take 141 divide it by three and then multiply it by eight and if you do that you will get 376 so say that again we take the 141 which is three parts of the ratio we divide it by three to get one part of the ratio and then multiply it by eight to get eight parts so we now have a mean for set b of 376 so if we know the mean is 376 in order to find the total of everything in set b added together we would multiply that by five because there are five numbers it's the opposite of working out the mean and if we do that we find that the total of all the numbers in set b is 1880 therefore if we add up the four numbers that we already have and they come to 1453 and we take that away from what we now know is the total we end up with x and x is 427 question 28 a straight line has gradient 4 
and pass us through the point 523. We have to work out the equation of the line in the form of y equals mx plus c. So let's have a look at this. We need to finish with y equals mx plus c. What do we already know? The gradient is 4. Now the gradient is the simple part, that is m. So we know that y equals 4x plus c. We now have a set of coordinates for one of the points of the line, so we know that where x is 5, y is 23. So if we substitute them in here, when y is 23 equals 4 times 5, x is 5 at this point here, plus c. So 23 equals 20 plus c. That must mean that 23 minus 20 equals c. Therefore c equals 3. Go back to our formula then, we have y equals we know that m is 4, 4x four plus, we now know that c is 3. So that is the formula of your line, y equals 4x plus 3. Question 29. Two sides of a triangle have lengths 13 and 27. Which of these is a possible length of the other side? Now this you need to do really by just visualisation. Imagine, let's look at these options. If one side of a triangle were 13 centimetres and one of the other sides was also 13 centimetres. So if you added these two together and opened them up as far as you possibly could, they could not be wide enough to fit a 27 centimetre side between them. Similarly with 13 and 14. If this were 14 and this were 13, you could not get 27 because even as a straight line they only add up to 27. It simply wouldn't fit. Moving to the other side of things here, if you had a side 40, it means the two original sides are 13 and 27. And again the same logic applies. If you add 27 and 13, you get 40. So even at 180 degrees to each other, it would be a straight line of 40. You cannot get another 40 centimetre side. It's too big. Therefore, the only possible option is 27. And finally, we get to question 30, and we're given a right-angled triangle. We are given two sides and an angle, and we're using trigonometry to work out the size of the angle. We are going to use our old friend, Sokotoa. Let's take a look at what we have. Angle X, that makes this side here the opposite, and of course this is the hypotenuse. Therefore, have a look along the line. Where do opposite and hypotenuse come together? It's here on the first part of Sokotoa. In other words, the sine of the angle X is equal to the opposite, which is 13, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 16. Let's turn that into a decimal. That means the sine of x is equal to 0 0.8125. So if sin x is 0 0.8125, you're going to have to find sin to the minus 1 of 0 0.8125. And the answer to that is 54.3. There's a long decimal. Let's stop it at one decimal place. 54.3 degrees. I do hope this video has been of some use to you. As always, if you would, please hit the subscribe button. It really does help me make more videos. And if you hit the like and the notification button as well, you'll get to hear any new videos. Good luck with your maths and thank you.